How's everybody doing? What's up? Welcome to Cooper Stuff. We have a bit of a weird week here. Obviously, it's uh, pretty strange because, I don't know if you know, but there's this uh, pandemic going on called the coronavirus, so it's kind of making things a little strange. You know what I'm saying? So, a lot of people have been like, uh, it's funny in the music business because it's like, this like thing has started where people are like, we need tons of content. We need tons of videos. We need tons of rice singing, perform your songs, play a concert. Um, it's kind of created like a monster. When I first thought of it, I thought, I'll do some things. And now it's like, it's just blowing up. There's so much information. And people are like, come on and tell us, everybody, what to do? What do you do in your time off? What are you doing in isolation? And uh, it's funny because as I said a few weeks ago, that this isn't really like hyper affecting you know, Wisconsin or probably lots of places in America. It's like this pandemic is happening. We know it's serious, but for a lot of us, I mean, it's affecting us because we have to be home. But in other words, we're not seeing like the terrible results of it. We're not seeing a lot of sick people. I think Wisconsin only has a handful of sick people in it. So I'm home. And I guess what I'm trying to say is besides the fact of like the economic, um, like insecurities of what's happening, a lot of this is just like what my plans were going to be anyway. <laughs> I was just going to be home, like sitting around. So now I'm home uh, doing a ton of social media stuff and interviews because everybody wants to interview and talk about it. So it's kind of funny. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that my tour was going to be over. When I'm off tour, I come home and I just like check out for a week. And I love to sit around and and basically do all the things that I'm getting to do now. <laughs> so it's kind of a weird time, I guess. So this Cooper stuff, I'm going to be telling you guys what I'm doing on my time off. First, I do want to say everybody up in Skillet World, 100% healthy. Thank God. My kids are good. My family's good. My in-laws are good. Uh, and the Skillet peeps are doing just fine, the band members and stuff like that. So very thankful for that. Everybody's doing totally fine. What are we up to on our time? Um, I am basically, here's, here's my feeling. If you have been on the road in a bus, cooped up at venues that don't have dressing rooms sometimes, and you've had to learn how to live your life in a bus, then basically you are prepared for the coronavirus isolation <laughs> because we live, you know, we live, we used to have 15 people in a bus and that was with my, I had two kids, we had a nanny, we had the full band, we had the full crew. That was a lot of people, and we, you just learn to live when you're on the road in these tiny spaces. And if you really need time alone, guess what you do? You put your, your headphones on, your music. <laughs> you listen to music. If you've got to have a fight with your wife, which I never do, ever, but if like you were married to someone who talked a ton and who was like hyper annoying but had a gorgeous beard, but it didn't make up for how stupid he was, and you needed to have a fight... You just got to do it in front of everybody. <laughs> so uh, me and my wife, basically, we just, me and Corey, we fight in front of people if we have to. We argue in front of people. We make business decisions in front of people. Basically, if you lived on the road in a bus, you are totally prepared for coronavirus. So what I want to encourage people before I jump into some of the things I'm doing is I want to encourage people, if you're sitting at home and you're like, I'm bored, I don't have anything to do, this sucks, I, I want to encourage you to live your life like you are on the road full time. Because when you're on the road, you have to make a decision about the kind of person you want to be. Some bands, some band members, uh, um, uh, maybe they've kind of chosen to just like live a life without any sort of, uh, you know, times where they get up, any sort of schedule, right? A lot of rock stars are like that. So they just basically live their, their lives and like, oh, we played video games till 5 a.m. and then we woke up and then I found myself over here. We decided to go eat. And for me, I decided a long time ago that I didn't want my life to be that way. I wanted to live my life being that the road is my normal life. Uh, it'd be different if you're going on the road for just like four weeks and that was it, or you're going on a two week trip. But if your life is going to be on the road, I wanted my life to be structured in some kind of a way. So I always go to bed pretty much at the same time on the road. I get up at the same time. I do the same stuff. I, you know, I have coffee with my wife. We hang out, talk. Then I go into my normal life. And in my normal life, I always work. I work out most every day. I read most every day. I pray uh, most every day. It should be every day. 
Sometimes I don't. What? I admitted it. It's not good. Sometimes I forget or get busy. But I do all these things every day. When my kids were young, I would hang out with my kids every day. Uh, I do my interviews every day. I like to have a schedule of the things that I do. If you're going to do that on the road, you have to learn how to do them in front of people is what I'm getting at. So one of the things uh, that people have been saying is, how do you work out when you can't leave your house? I can't go to the gym because of coronavirus. I'm like, dude, I work out in a dressing room every day. If I don't have a dressing room, I work out outside the bus every day. If I don't have a good place to work out on the street. One time I worked out in a public restroom. That's right. And I don't mean work out like work out a taco, if you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, that's sick. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about actual working out in a public restroom. I did that on the road. When we were on tour with Nickelback, I remember working out of the hallway a few times because we were in Europe. And we had uh, always had a really nice dressing room. But the problem was is that sometimes the venues didn't have enough rooms for crew and things like that. So I remember one time thinking, there are 15 people in this tiny room. And I remember I was working out in the hallway right for catering. So all the, the band members would walk by me. I'd be like, don't mind me getting my workout on. How do you work out if you don't have any weights? There are tons of ways you can work out, guys. Um, I like to carry DVDs. Some of my favorite workout DVDs were called T25. T25 was awesome with Sean T. Sean T is probably more known for a workout series called Insanity. But Insanity is just insane. <laughs> you know it. It really is, though. Insanity is just too much. But, uh, but T25 is perfect. 25 minutes, you don't have to have weights. You don't have to have band, you know, the band. I say bands like, you know, those stretchy bands. Now, those are great to work out with on the road because stretchy bands don't, you know, take up any weight in your bag and things like that. But, uh, but you don't even have to have bands for that. It's going to be push-ups and body weight and lots of cardio exercise. So I love all those kind of DVDs. I got really into, um, well, I'll think of the name of it in a second. Another thing you do if you're like, dude, I don't have any weights. I don't have any DVDs. I don't know anything to do. I read something a few years ago that I put into practice that's actually pretty awesome. If you just do 30 second blast of, of anything that is, is like uh, high heart rate, okay? Anything you do for as fast as you can for 30 seconds, you'll burn a ton of calories. This is going to sound stupid to some people, but if all you do is run in place as fast as you can uh, for 30 seconds, then you take a 30 second break. Then you hit it again. So you just do this uh, in eight different consecutive things. You can do anything, jumping jacks, but not slow ones. I mean, fast jumping jacks. Like, <laughs> uh, you'll be amazed at how much it will tire your arms out. Burpees, you can do burpees. If burpees get too easy for you, you can do the burpees with uh, jumps where you touch your knees, you know. Up, uh, that was me touching my knees. Up, uh, it's easier when you're sitting down. Anyway. Any of those things will work. Sometimes I even do, uh, have you ever seen the exercise? What do they call them? I think they call them like ropes or whatever, like where you, you get the you know two ends of a, a rope and it's wrapped around something and you do it like this. Even if you don't have a rope, if you just do that, you will find it'll work your arms really well. So sometimes on the road, I'll do anything I need to do. So what I wanna encourage people to do is this. Don't treat this time at home as if you're going on like a two week tour. What I mean is when you go on a two-week tour, maybe you don't ever get into a routine. You just sit around playing video games all day, eating too much pizza, and in the end, you, you feel really chaotic and really stressed because you never got into a routine. And a lot of people on the road, that's why they end up doing like substance abuse and things because the road has a way of making you not realize like what time it is, where you don't know what city you're in half the time. People end up just getting, they just feel like totally adrift. It's actually better for you as a person, even scientifically, to put yourself inside of boundaries. It'll cause you to be more disciplined. So I want to encourage people this, this. When you're at home during this coronavirus isolation board, put yourself into boundaries and say, you know what, even if I can't go and do the things that I want to do, even do some things I need to do, I'm going to put myself in those boundaries and it is going to cause me to have discipline and to meet goals, okay? So working out, I always find, is almost like step one for me to get myself motivated. 
Not everybody feels that way. It might be silly to some people, but I always find if I work, if I'm motivated to work out, then I can do anything. Uh, you get up, you do what you need to do. That workout helps me. Uh, it helps me be disciplined in other areas of my life. Might sound cheesy to some people. Some of you might be like, I totally get that, man. So for me, I do that. Let's see, what else am I doing in my break? I am excited and I would like to make an announcement to you. I finally finished my book. I've been writing a book for about four months and um, I finally finished it this week. I only had one chapter left, but then it took me a, about five days to go back and Basically, when you finish the book, you go back and you read early chapters and you're like, oh my gosh, that's so stupid, you idiot. And then you go back and you change stuff. Well, that's what I've been doing. I do not have a publisher, so I don't know when it's going to come out. For all I know, all the publishers will be like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever read. Could happen. We'll see. But either way, I wrote that sucker and it's done. I hope to tell you more about it soon. But I love to read. Reading is one of my favorite things to do. So I was planning on being home after tour and I was going to have two weeks of reading to catch up on a lot of the things I've been studying. I would encourage people because I know a lot of people don't love reading. If you're someone who doesn't like to read, maybe you even feel, if it makes you feel like, you know, dumb because you don't like to read, one of those people like, I feel so stupid. And I'm like, I want to tell you guys, I hated reading until I was about 30 years old, um, which I'm only like 28 now if you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? But I really hated reading when I was a young person, never thought I would like it. I used to always be like, how do people just sit around and read? But I love it now. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some of the books I'm reading because people always ask me. So if you're someone who doesn't like to read, hey, you could change in, in your older life. If you're somebody that says, it's not that I hate reading, but I can't pay attention, maybe that's your problem. I could never pay attention when I was reading. I would start going through all the lists of all the things I had to do. So I learned to read by going in short blasts. So maybe that helps you. In other words, I would read for 10 minutes, maybe eight minutes. <laughs> That's my attention span. I'd read for eight minutes and then I would take a break for 10 minutes just to get my mind, you know, set. And then I would start up again. Eventually, I just got to where I could read for really long periods of time. So I like to read all sorts of things. I mainly now enjoy reading theology, uh, philosophy, social science, culture, things like that. I do still read fiction though. So I will start with you guys. This is a great time. If you like to read and you have, you know, if you like to read, it may, I don't know if you're like me, but maybe you go on Amazon or you go to Barnes and Noble and you buy like, oh, I'm going to totally get into reading and you buy like 5,000 books and you've never cracked any of them open. This is a good time to go, well, I'm sitting around not doing anything else anyway. Years ago when I started reading, I went and bought all the classics and a lot of them I never had time to do. So this is George Orwell's Animal Farm. Can you see that? Boom. This is a classic. I like George Orwell quite a lot. He wrote a book called 1984 that um, I really love that was one of those like uh, creepy prophetic books that, that was written so long ago, but you read and you go, oh my gosh, that's the time that we're living in right now. 1984 is very dystopian future, but it speaks a lot about like the power of propaganda, the power of media. The, uh, a lot of, in fact, a lot of the phrases that we use, if you ever watch politics or if you ever watch uh, anything to do with like culture studies, a lot of the language that we use sometimes is actually from 1984. Uh, I'm assuming you've heard the term big brother and meaning when we talk about the government, sometimes we say, hey, watch out, big brother's watching you. That is from the book, 1984, he, he made that up. Another one would be if you've ever heard double speak, they're like, man, don't give me double speak. That is actually also from 1984. That is a really good one. Animal Farm, I know what it's about um, and already. Uh, but I've never read it, so I'm going to dive into that because why not? I'm sitting around not doing anything else, but I haven't started it yet. Um, I have just begun reading, again, one of my favorite books of all time. Check it out. Here it is. A.W. Tozer, Knowledge of the Holy. Here, write it down if you want to. Here's how you spell it. A.W. Tozer, The Knowledge of the Holy. This is probably the first, what I would call... Um, real theological book I ever read, but I'll tell you why. Well, I like it for lots of reasons, but check it out. Look, that's not very thick, right? This is only, you know, 110 pages long. A lot of people are scared to dive into theology and 
uh, the Bible and reading about commentaries from what other of uh, you know the saints have said about uh, the uh, the Bible and whatnot. Because they're so, the books are really thick. Theology books are really thick, and it's hard language to understand. What I love about A.W. Tozer is that he's just as smart as any of the theologians, but he writes in a way that I, that I understood even as a, a 20-year-old man. Um, so when I, as I told you guys, I did not like reading until I was about 30 years old. So I had to suffer through reading this book because my attention span was so bad, but I did not have to suffer in terms of the difficulty of understanding it. I recommended this book last year when I wrote a, uh, a post on getting to know who God is. And the reason this is such a fantastic book is it is on basically the attributes of God. And what the attributes of God are for people that don't know theology, all the attributes mean is it's basically saying, this is who God is. This is the aspects of his personality, of who he is. For instance, the God is omnipotent, meaning that he is all-powerful. Well, why? what does it mean to be all-powerful? And why do we know that God is all-powerful? This is a really great book to do that. So if you are someone who's watched Cooper's stuff and has been like, man, I don't really understand the Bible. I don't really, how do you know this stuff about God? How do I find out these things about God? You can get this book, listen, on your Kindle for a dollar, okay? For a buck, you can get it. So if you can't go out to the bookstore, if Amazon stops delivering, go on your Kindle and download it for a buck, okay? This book radically changed my life, so check it out. What else am I reading? I'm reading, this is gonna make me sound like I'm some hyper crazy reader. I love to read, but the thing is I've been studying a lot. So it's not just that I've been reading, I've been studying. So I normally do not like reading multiple books at once because my attention deficit, uh, I can't take on like th three books at once is like way too much information. I like to start it and I like to finish it. And I have a rule. Even if I don't like the book I'm reading, even if not, I'm not enjoying it, I have to finish it. If I don't finish it, I feel like a loser. My wife will be like, if you don't like it, just put it down. I'm like, I can't do that because then I'm a quitter and quitters never win. That's a weird John thing. It's Probably actually not healthy, but that's where we're at. But I have been reading three books simultaneously because I've been doing various studies for, for different Bible studies and sermons and my books. So uh, here we go. Check this out. This book is ab absolutely crushing me. Here it is. It is called The Doctrine of the Word of God, and it is by John Frame. Can you see that? The Doctrine of the Word of God. Now, this is a big one. I've only gotten that far in it, which, as you can tell, is not very far. <laughs> but it's taken me so long, you guys. This book is so, so really wonderful. If you're into theology and you're into the Bible stuff, it's been difficult to find a really great book on uh, the, the infallibility of, of the Bible basically on the authority of scripture. Now, there are some really great, there's one um, classic that everybody really likes, and all of a sudden, I can't remember the name of it. I have it upstairs. It's the classic, can't remember the name of it, sorry, written hundreds of years ago. But I find it a little bit hard to understand, to be honest. It's good information, but I need somebody to, to read it and explain it to me. I don't even mind admitting it. This book, The Doctrine of the Word of God, it has been the best book, that, that it, the easiest to understand. It's extremely thorough. Talking about it on the importance of the Bible, why you know you can trust the Bible. So um, I know not everybody's going to be into reading a book that thick, but if you're somebody that is looking for one of those, this is actually a series by John Frame. He has The Doctrine of God. It's basically his systematic theology, Doctrine of God. I believe the doctrine of man. I can't. I can't remember what they are, but that's basically what that is. Uh, moving on, I do love systematic theology in general, and I have just begun um, Burkhoff's systematic theology. This is how you spell his name, in case you want to know what it is. I really love this. Now, a lot of people might not like it because it is um, reformed theology, but I've gotten pretty pretty far in this book, as you can tell. I've been crushing it reading three sections at once, but I'm really liking it. What I will say about this book, even if you as a Christian don't subscribe to all of this particular line of theology, which I know a lot of people won't, what I like about this book is that he explains 
uh, he explains the arguments of others' theology. So as we're looking at things that maybe some people might uh, disagree on, he explains simple versions of the different of uh, you know lines of thinking, and I quite like that. Okay, last book that I am reading right now. This is not a Christian book. This is a social science book. It is called Human Diversity. <clears throat> Excuse me, Charles Murray. And this is, you can say, Biology of Gender, Race, and Class. I'm reading this book because I get a lot of questions from people about all sorts of social issues and cultural issues. And look how far I've gotten in that one. Boom, I've been crushing this one. Um, this, in my opinion, is quite a difficult book to read. I like culture studies, but this guy is so far above me. Um, but it's still very good because we're living in a really crazy time. And I find, um, as a Christian, what matters is what the Bible says as a Christian. But I also like to understand where science is at on, on certain topics because we have, to, we have to learn how to bring our faith to the issues of the world. We can't just deny that there are issues and confusion in the world. Now, I'm not saying that the world should, um, you know... <laughs> define what I believe. The Bible tells me what to believe, but we should understand where those issues fit in to our faith. And a lot of people have been asking me, even in my friendships, great friends of mine, what do we do about A, B, and C? Even as parents, what do I do when my kid asks me A, B, or C? And so I've been uh, reading that and it's been quite a good time. So if you are at home and bored in tears, you need some good books, recommendations. Those are the books that I am currently reading. Mainly what I want to encourage you on, though, is this. If you are a Christian, um, even if you're not, but I'm especially challenging Christians. If you are not a Christian, uh, excuse me, <laughs> I just said that. Sorry. If you are a Christian, then guess what you should be doing at home? Read your Bible, man. The Bible is so wonderful. Check it out. You're at home for coronavirus. Oh, God, I don't have anything to do. I'm bored. What do I do? Wouldn't it be really super cool? I'm going to say a cheesy analogy, but here it goes. If you could get on the phone and talk to somebody really, really important, your favorite celebrity, like, I don't know, Skillet. Oh, just kidding. Get on the phone and talk to whoever it is that you think's super awesome and have a conversation. Christians don't understand or we forget how amazing the Bible is, all right? The Bible is not just good ideas, I always say this every week. It's not just good ideas. It's not just God's random thoughts, okay? When I say random, what I mean is like this. As people, we have random thoughts. Not everything that I say to my kids is amazing. What? Duh. You know, I, I, I'm constantly talking. I say some real important things to my kids sometimes. A lot of the times I say things that aren't super important. Or else, you know, I'll say, hey, it's pretty important that you clean your room. But I might say, it's urgent that you never steal, right? It's imperative that you don't steal. It's pretty important you clean your room too. We have all these varying degrees as humans of the things that we say that are you know, super important, not important, wrong, untrue, random opinions. Everything that God says is right. Everything that God says matters. It's not like for him like, yeah, that wasn't too important, but, but check it out anyway. Everything that God says is his word and his word is perfect right it wouldn't make any sense for god to say things that weren't perfect that is why the bible is like having that phone call with that really important person i warned you'd be cheesy everybody's like oh he just said it but it's totally true the bible is god's personal words to mankind it's his personal words to me it's his personal words to you so we should take it as such we're sitting at home with nothing to do and everybody's like, oh, I just really need something to get me by. Crack open the Bible, wipe the dust off of it, you know, <laughs> and, and enjoy what God has to say to you. He has so much to say to you in way of hope. There is no reason for us Christians to be at home feeling absolutely hopeless when the word tells us to trust in God. That's what the Bible says. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. God gives us really great things, uh, words that, that make us have hope in who he is. Make us have hope that he's in control. Remind us that even when times are hard, that our God loves us with passion. That reminds us even when the coronavirus comes in and wrecks all of our plans, 
that he has a plan and that whatever he does is going to be right and good and according to his purpose and we get to fit into his purpose. Isn't that really cool? The Bible will remind you in times where you are scared to put your trust in God, that you don't need to live in fear. There's a Bible verse that says that. God does not give us a spirit of fear, but he gives us a spirit of power, love, and sound mind. Sound mind. You know what sound mind means? It means you're not freaking out at home about the coronavirus. It means that you might go, woo, this is pretty strange times, but God has given me peace and a sound mind. The Bible's so full of wonderful words about who he is. If you don't know where to start, maybe you're not a Christian. You're like, dude, the Bible's huge. Where do I start reading this? I have two recommendations. Number one, the book of John. It is called the Gospel of John. It is in the New Testament. If you can't remember the word of it, it's my name. It's John, okay? The, book, the Gospel of John is my favorite gospel. It is a little bit hard to understand at times, but it's my favorite gospel because it talks about Jesus, uh, not just in, in history, but it makes it very clear that Jesus is actually God. Because understand this, whether you're a Christian or not, understand that if Jesus wasn't God, if he was just a really good man, then he's, I guess he's worth reading about just like Gandhi would be worth reading about, all right? Just like any good person that said some good stuff and did some cool stuff, that's worth reading about, but it's not worth giving your life for. So the Gospel of John doesn't just tell about Jesus as a man that did acts in history. It tells about Jesus being God. And that is the reason that he is worth putting all of your life in. Because if he was just a man, then salvation in Christ really means nothing. Because he can't save. If he's just a man, he can't die for your sins. If he's just a man, he cannot break the power of sin over your life. If he's just a man, he can't recreate your heart into being something new. And he has no peace to offer you. But he's not just a man, he is God. And you can read about that in the book of John, which is really beautiful and wonderful. If you're looking for a place that you go, I just want to read something that's going to give me encouragement, then open up your Bible to Psalms. Psalms is easy to find. If you don't know the Bible, it's really easy. All you got to do is you get the Bible, you look in the very middle of the Bible, and you open it up, and it will be Psalms. And you go to it. The reason Psalms is going to be so great for a time like this is because Psalms is a book of, it's like it's poems to God, it's prayers to God, it's songs to God. Psalms is really wonderful because you will read poems or songs written by men who were going through tough times. For instance, they're going through a pandemic. Not really, but it, it, that's a good example. You're going through a tough time in a pandemic. You're scared. You want to pray something to God. You write your prayer down. That's a little bit what Psalms is like, except Psalms is so full of hope and so full of the majesty of God. The reason that the, the poems and Psalms is different than me, if I wrote a poem to God right now, it might be a really good poem. The reason the book of Psalms is way better than my poem is because the book of Psalms is God's words. Yes, it was men that wrote it, but they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write that. So it's not, you know, once again, it's not words of man, it's words of God. So when you read the book of Psalms, you will be filled with hope. You will be filled with, you know, uh, a, a trust in God because we will see that there have been people before us who also struggled, had fear, were feeling that God had left them behind at times, felt that maybe he wasn't listening, felt betrayed, their enemies were overtaking them. But in those poems to God, the hope of God always comes. And, and it, you, as you're reading the psalm, you'll be like, yes, I feel just like that right now. All, all of my hope feels lost, but then it'll flip at the end of the psalm and he will say, you know, somebody like, like David, who wrote a lot of the Psalms, he'll say, you know what? Where does my trust come from? My trust comes from you. Where does my hope come from? It comes from you alone. You're the only one that I can trust. And that will give you hope and it will give you peace to keep going during this crazy time we're in right now. So that's what we are up to at the Cooper House. We are reading. We are enjoying God. We are making food together. We're having fun together. We're laughing together, watching TV together. And um, I want to encourage you guys, don't waste all your time at home fretting and freaking out. 
Be disciplined, get some boundaries, make some goals, enjoy yourself as much as you can. Please keep being safe, people. I want to see every single one of you guys be safe, and I hope to see you down the road. Until next time, thank you for watching Cooper Stuff. Cooper Stuff!